And Navina is just getting us up and running, so give it one sec. <clears throat> well, I'll just start with a formal welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for um, our webinar series on our HEAL platform for real food. Uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with our HEAL platform. We'll share a little bit about what that is um, in just a bit. But the focus of today will be on um, our first plank of our platform, which is dignity for all workers and their families. Um, this is a really timely conversation and discussion uh, with everything that we're seeing going on right now. So we are really excited to have um, the group of folks joining us today to share their work um, on this important plank. And, um, yeah, just talk about maybe some ways to be engaged as well. So what we've got on deck for today, a quick agenda review. We'll um, uh, do some intros of who's gonna be um, leading us through this conversation today. We'll talk a little bit more about the HEAL platform for real food. Um, what we're doing with this webinar, webinar series around our platform and, and our launch, and then shift into um, hearing from a few of our members. We've got three members joining us today. Um, then we'll shift into question and answers, talk a little bit about some campaigns um, that are going on right now and ways to get involved. And then we'll close and wrap up with um, where you all can find this toolkit um, that we'll be putting together, uh, not just for this plank, but for future ones as well. Um, so before I talk a little bit about HEAL, um, I'm Marla Karina Larrabe. Um, just thought I should say my name. <laughs> um, so you know who's talking. Um, but I'll introduce the rest of our team shortly. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar with HEAL, HEAL Food Alliance, uh, we are a coalition. Our mission is to build collective power to create food and farm systems that are healthy for our families, accessible and affordable for all communities, and fair to the hard working people who grow, distribute, prepare, and serve our food while protecting the air, water, and land that we all depend on. Um, as I mentioned, we're a coalition and we are comprised of a little bit of over 50 members all across um, uh, the HEAL, Health, Environment, Agriculture, and Labor sectors. Um, so here's a quick snapshot of some of our members. And, and yeah, that's, I will turn it over now to Navina to share a little bit more about um, the thinking behind our, our platform and, and the planks in the webinar series here. Davina, I can't hear you. Just unmuting myself. Uh, thanks everyone for being here with us today. And thanks Marla for um, taking us through that introduction. We have about 80 folks right now um, joining us for this webinar and we really want to encourage folks to use the chat function to stay in touch with each other right now, ask questions of each other, um, and feel free to introduce yourselves to each other as well. We know that in this unprecedented moment that we're in right now, we're all figuring out ways to do our organizing in more digital ways and um, through these kind of virtual gatherings. Uh, so we want to really encourage you all to just introduce yourself, say your, your name and where you're calling in from for this Zoom so that folks get to know each other as we do this work together. And, um, you know, Marla, Marla mentioned that HEAL is a collaborative of organizations. So HEAL itself stands for Health, Environment, Agriculture, and Labor. And we came together with the idea that it was essential for groups from all different sectors of the food system to be organizing together to build our collective power so that we could transform this system in ways that um, make it something that is fair for all people working across the food system, all consumers, and uh, act with 
respect for our planet and all people, rather than having profit as the motivator, that life is the motivator for how we, um, how we collectively steward our food systems and our lives. And uh, when we first came together, we designed this 10 point platform called the Platform for Real Food that Zena will talk a little bit more about. Um, this plank is the first plank of our platform, dignity and fairness for all workers and their families. And the reason why that has been part of our work from the very beginning is because there's, there's a long history of why workers in the food system have been facing um, really exploitative and extractive conditions for a long time. So the, the folks that you'll be hearing from today are folks who have been working to transform that for, for many years in their own communities, organizing in different ways. Um, you'll hear from speakers in the restaurant industry, in the farm work, and folks who are working to create um, localized regional food system, working with um, production and cooperative ownership and what it means for worker transformation. And uh, what we're seeing right now in this moment is that COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're in right now, uh, workers, food workers, are being recognized as essential workers. They have been essential workers, they continue to be essential workers, and um, the conditions that they're under right now are being exacerbated by the crisis that we're in right now, but it's not, it's not something new, right? So the 22 million folks who work across our food system um, are, are folks who, who have been doing this essential work for us for a long time. Um, so our, our goal today is to really, in this moment, as we're seeing how, um, how workers are being affected, to talk not only about uh, what's happening right now and ways that folks can take action right now to ensure that workers across the food system stay safe, um, and we'll point you to a few different resor resources and actions that you can take to ensure that workers stay safe right now, but also to build resilient food systems for the long haul. Um, so as you hear from speakers, you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, just, to, just to name who we are from HEAL who are talking, my name is Navina. I use she, her, or they pronouns. Um, I am based here in Oakland, occupied Ohlone land. Um, and I'm the director of the HEAL Food Alliance. You heard from Marla, who is based in the DEC area. Um, you'll also hear a little bit from Jose Oliva, who's our campaigns director based in Chicago, and um, Zina Anise, who put together an incredible um, toolkit for everyone to really understand what the, the full gamut of how, how we got to where we are right now in our food system and, and where we're going together. Um, so I'll turn it over to Zinab to share a little bit more about that. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. We're really, we've been working on the platform toolkit for a few months now, so we're really excited to have all of you all um, have a look at it and learn from it. Um, so to pick up where Navina left off, um, so HEAL stands for Health, Environment, Agriculture, and Labor. And the platform, the 10 point platform for real food really captures uh, a multi-sector approach and vision for how we're moving, um, we're transforming the food system in all these sectors. And um, the first plank of the platform is, as Navina mentioned, dignity for all workers, which is, has just gotten increasingly like, relevant over the course of the last few weeks. Um, and the platform toolkit is, um, really serves two purposes. One is to talk about, um, our understanding, like HEAL's understanding and of what the work happening in food and labor uh, means to us. It helps uh, folks understand the plank better and also points to um, different resources that you can use to build knowledge around the plank. And the second purpose of the toolkit really is to highlight the work that HEAL's members are already doing to take different parts, different planks of the platform forward. And because this particular uh, plank focuses on dignity of workers, we've spoken to um, so our members who work in food and labor. And we, for this particular plank, we have an interview with Gabriel of Brand Workers about what it's, how it's been to organize workers in the time of ice raids. So to take you through what's in the toolkit, 
uh, we have a video, which is a three minute, um, like a quick explainer that captures the core of the plank. Um, and two, we have member dispatches, which are interviews with members, like the one I mentioned with Gabriel. Uh, three, we have an explainer, which really breaks down the kind of things that I, um, that ex um, inform heels work around the plank. And two, we, uh, four, we have a resource toolkit, which has um, organizing resources, books, films, um, reports that have been put together by our members and allies. It has stuff, it has um, a really great toolkit from Real Food Media. It has a few reports from FCWA. And if you're a member and you feel like you have something that should be included in this uh, resource list, please let us know and we'll put it in there. Um, so the toolkit is really a live document. It lives on our website and we are hoping to build on it and add things to it to um, kind of enhance like folks understanding of the plank as we move along. Uh, so if you all have things that you all feel like need to be added into that resource list, please let me know and I can do that. And I'm going to pass it back to Marla. Thanks, Sina. Thanks, Navina. Um... Yeah, so you're hearing now a little bit about the background and context to um, these series of webinars. Um, today's our first one, and we're so excited to actually get into, um, yeah, the, the work. What are members and folks on the ground doing? Um, so with that, I'm excited to um, introduce a few members that are joining us today. Rose Bookbinder co-director and organizer of Pioneer Valley Workers Association, Antonio Tovar, interim general coordinator, principal investigator, community-based participatory research projects with academic institutions um, over at Farm Workers Association of Florida, and Teofilo Reyes, research director at Restaurant Opportunities uh, Center United. And last but not least, our campaign's director, Jose Oliva, who's actually going to be moderating this portion of the discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jose. Great. Thank you so much, Marla. <clears throat> and thank you, um, Rose and Theo and Antonio, for making time to present on this webinar. Um, we know um, that everything has shifted over the course of the last couple of weeks because of COVID. And uh, we know that food workers uh, have been deemed essential workers. And we also know that we are at both ends of the spectrum, right? Folks who are in the restaurant industry who are completely unemployed, especially tipped workers who are completely unemployed, um, and folks in the warehouse and farm industries that are working extra long hours um, at the same pay in some cases and with little to no protective equipment and no information. Um, I do wanna say that there's a lot of resources, all of which we will go over uh, later in the program uh, that Food Chain Workers Alliance, one of our founding uh, members has put together um, based on the uh, great information that they've gathered from all of um, our members uh, at the local and state and national level. Um, so we'll make sure to share all of that with you. Um, I want to introduce um, the format for this conversation. Uh, what we were thinking before we hit COVID is that um, we wanted to get people a really thorough understanding of why food workers are um, as marginalized as they are, right? We knew all along that they were essential workers. We knew all along that it is the 21 and a half million people who work in the food system that feed us every day. Uh, but yet they make the lowest wages and yet they are the ones who are most exploited uh, either for immigration status, for uh, race, or for whatever other reason. Um, that those folks are oftentimes the most marginalized folks in our workforces. Um, so that was our thinking ahead of time. And then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, it actually highlighted all of that. It sort of brought it to light. Um, and so I think um, what we're going to hear next, um, the order 
is going to be, um, Rose is gonna go first and uh, from the Bi uh, Pioneer Valley Worker Center. And then we'll hear uh, from Antonio from the Farm Worker Association of Florida. And then Teofilo is gonna close it from the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United. Um, and what I wanna say just to introduce uh, Rose is that um, part of what their efforts have been in uh, Massachusetts have been amazing because it's spanning the entire food system, right? It's farm workers, it's restaurant workers, it's uh, workers in other sectors as well. Uh, and so they have this sort of holistic understanding of how the food system works, uh, both at the regional and at the local level. Uh, and so I want to hand it over to Rose to give us uh, more of her perspective. Rose? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Jose and the team at um, HEAL for um, inviting me to speak to you all today. Um, and uh, just want to sort of take a moment to recognize just um, just to be honest with all of you that it's been a hard couple weeks for me. I have two young kids um, at home now and our membership um, is predominantly um, restaurant and farm workers who are undocumented and are calling us every day running out of money. Um, and so it's just been an intense few days. And so just thinking of all of you on this phone call who are also dealing with similar things like that, whether it's um, supporting members who are experiencing, you know, real need right now, or for those of you who are working from home with young kids running around trying to do your best to support your community or those of you who are immunocompromised or know, have a loved one who you can't see, um, just want to hold that space for a second and just sort of also asking you all to be kind with me in this presentation. I had hoped for it to be more polished, but um, the reality is, is that's just not possible in this moment. So um, just want to recognize all of you and what you're going through and that um, the more we're able to connect in spaces like this, I think the more potential we are we have to building the better world that we know we deserve now and we deserve in the future. So um, just had to get that off my chest to start. Um, so um, I'm gonna uh, attempt to screen share. I um, have a few slides to share. So let's see if this works. Um, hold on. Um, sorry. Okay, can you guys see that? No. No? No. Okay, uh, one sec. And I'll just take this moment while you're setting that up, Rose, to yep. feel free to pop in questions um, as they come to you. We'll have some time for questions and answers um, once we hear from all our um, guest speakers joining us today. I see some of you are already making good use of that function. So keep it coming. Okay, there, is that working now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, as folks already introduced, um, I am one of the co-directors at the Pioneer Valley Worker Center. We operate as a collective. Um, so we try to model the world that we want to build with trying to create um, non-hierarchical systems. And, um, you know, of course, we believe that in order to be fleshing out a really true food justice movement, um, food and farm workers are central to that. Um, and uh, this statement for us is really important. Um, nothing about us without us is for us. And that's a really central tenement to our work that we make sure that as an organization, anything that we're doing includes those, are, those that are most impacted by the campaigns that we're working on. And um, you know, I myself was a restaurant worker for many years, um, all through high school, through college and after, and that's, you know, I saw firsthand, um, you know, what it was like to work in a restaurant, um, the differences between front of the house and the back of the house, recognizing my privilege as a white person and, and being 
you know, the times when I was a server, the differences between how I was treated compared to my coworkers who were immigrant and undocumented in the back of the house. And feel very lucky now to be a part of an organization that is um, thinking about how we're creating respect and dignity in those um, workplaces where uh, our food system workers are and making sure that if we're creating a sustainable food system that it's grounded and also creating a sustainable um, workplace for those food workers. And I think this has been mentioned already, but there's you know 22 million workers in the food system, making up the largest employment sector in the United States with over um, one out of every seven workers in the US working on the food chain. And I just wanna mention that a lot of the facts that I am providing come from the Food Chain Workers Alliance, which has also been mentioned, and I have the great privilege to serve as the board chair for that organization. Um, so our work is rooted in our worker committees where we have um, a few hundred worker members and those committees meet uh, bi-monthly to strategize around campaigns and ongoing work. And Workers identify solutions to collective problems. And as I mentioned, most of our workers are restaurant and farm workers, but now post COVID-19, we have many, many retail food workers who have joined with us weekly during our worker assemblies that we've been holding um, since this pandemic started um, to um, make sure that we're thinking about all along the food chain what's needed. Um, I don't know, I'm hearing, um, Someone's hold to music. Music. <laughs> if yeah. you're not on mute yet, please place yourself on mute. We can hear your hold music. Someone has us on hold, and so they can't <laughs> hear us. So I, I think we have to mute everyone who's not speaking. Who has the master? I'm trying to do that right now. Yeah, the, the host can put all on silence and then uh, open rows. Yeah. Um, so um, this is just an image from our Springfield, Massachusetts Worker Committee after one of their meetings. Um, while they were planning around organizing around May Day. Um, and um, these are just some more photos of our, our committees. As Jose mentioned, you know, we have folks all up and down the food system. And these are um, actually two photos um, of two wins in two different cities around wage theft ordinances, which is a really fabulous tool that um, food system workers can use to enhance local legislation to ensure that they're not experiencing wage theft. Um, workers in the food system experience very high rates of wage theft, meaning um, perhaps not being paid over time, not paying, being paid for the hours they've worked, um, not being provided with paid sick time if they work in a state that um, provides that. And so what a wage theft ordinance does, um, or it can do in, in the situations where we've won, is to tie the license of either a restaurant or a farm to their compliance with wage and hour laws. And if they're found to be in violation of wage and hour laws, they can actually lose their license and are also obligated to take out insurance in the amount of an entire year's salary for every worker. So it um, really tries to um, put more hands, more leverage in the hands of workers uh, to be paid what they rightly deserve. Um, and so these are two successes, one in Northampton and one in Springfield, Massachusetts, where our um, farm worker and restaurant workers won wage theft ordinances. And if folks are interested in learning about those, um, you are more than welcome to reach out. Um, um, these are just some general facts around um, food chain workers that's pulled from a report um, from the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Um, Food chain pays the lowest hourly median wage to frontline workers compared to all other industries. The annual median wage is 16,000 and the hourly medium wage is $10, well below the median wages across all other industries. Um, food chain workers rely on public assistance and are more food insecure than any other workers. And again, that's being um, right now in this pandemic, that's even more huge um, because many of what many of the workers in the food system are, you know, immigrant workers who don't have access to unemployment right now and are, because they were already living paycheck to paycheck, their food insecurity levels are just unbelievably high right now. Um, 
significant racial and gender wage gaps exists and rates of injury and illness at work for food workers have risen every year since 2010. Um, and 21% of the workers in the food industry are immigrant workers, but we have to recognize that many of those folks are hidden from day to day life. And so the reality is, even though that's a number that has been sort of um, confirmed, we, we believe that it's actually much higher than that. Um, in our organization, we believe that if workers are going to be able to organize, they also need to have their material needs met. So um, in the winter months when our farm worker members are not working, we do um, monthly food distribution and we get um, support from local farms and also donations from stores and other resources. So we make sure that folks material needs are being met in order for them to actually be able to build power in their workplaces. Um, we've also built a um, elaborate network that's called Solidarity in the Streets, which is a rapid response network that supports workers, especially food system workers who want to organize um, in their workplaces. It supports um, issues around immigration raids, detentions and deportations. And now it's, um, I've been really impressed with this network's ability to rapidly um, change and support around COVID-19 response. And that network has around 3000 activists and 40 congregations in our area. And it was established in 2016. Um, we also um, were given the opportunity um, with a local city here for some land and some of our farm worker members have created a uh, worker co-op that's being run predominantly by undocumented folks so that we're able to sort of show examples to folks that are not um, able to own their own businesses what a dignified workplace can look like. And so not only are we creating dignified um, uh, employment, but we're also helping to feed our community through this farm. Um, and now I just wanted to also share some facts around um, some of our farm worker members. We um, were able to win those wage theft ordinance based off of surveys that we've done to better understand what the conditions are like for our members. And so we're engaged right now in a, a similar um, process with farm workers as we did with restaurant workers. And I just wanted to share some of the facts because I just think that it's, it's just unbelievable the conditions that that you know workers are going through, and it's important for us to um, have an understanding of that as we're thinking about this. So we surveyed um, over 200 workers, um, many of whom are Central American, from 48 different farms in our area. 53% um, of them do not receive access to free protective gear such as gloves and masks for working with chemicals. And now that problem again is even more horrific with workers who are working in nurseries and greenhouses that have be, are being told right now to use the same gloves all week and sitting next to people um, while they're preparing the food that's gonna be going to our grocery stores and probably you know, just spreading um, COVID-19 to each other and potentially to the food. 48% um, report not consistently having access to a bathroom. 37% say they do not have reliable access to clean water, adding that they get reprimanded for pursuing to drink water in the fields. 70% of immigrant workers said that they're required to work longer hours and do heavier lifting than their white or US born peers. And the white workers who filled out the forms also confirmed this, describing better treatment, such as longer breaks, more flexible schedules, easier work, and higher pay than their immigrant peers. 89% work over 40 hours a week, with 25% working more than 60 hours a week, 40% making less than $12 an hour. So just so folks know, in, in our state of Massachusetts, we're um, gearing up to have $15 an hour in 2023, but the minimum wage for farm workers is $8 an hour. And if um, you can believe it, it, up until 2008, the minimum wage for farm workers was $1 an hour in Massachusetts. Um, and I think we'll hear more about the legacy of slavery in our farm work from Antonio later. 88% um, do not get any paid sick days, including at many farms where they are legally entitled to. 87% frequently work without being paid and 53% frequently have to do work which puts their own safety at risk. And 33% have a monthly income of just 1,000 to 1,500 a month. Um, 
This is just a quote from one of our members. Um, so these are some um, recommendations that are taken from the Food Chain Workers Alliance in their report. And I wanted to share those quickly and then um, talk some specifics about demands around COVID-19. Um, could I just get a time check too? Sorry, I forgot to. Um, yeah, you. Um, if you could, yeah, maybe like five minutes or so. Okay, would you think? great, thank you. Um, so um, what can you do? Um, workplace justice campaigns and union drives need the support of consumers to help, oh, sorry, um, to strengthen workers' rights efforts to win better pay and working conditions. Consumers can also support food workers by purchasing products from companies that are fair trade, union made, or have high labor standards. The public can call on policymakers to support pro-worker legislation, and people can educate one another and discuss food worker issues in their da daily lives, especially in conversations around local, organic, and sustainable food. And again, that last one just again reminds us, you know, if you are working in food policy work or food justice work, I really you know suggest that you figure out who are the organizations in your areas that are working directly with impacted food workers to make sure that this what you're creating is you know aligned and being led by those that are that are most impacted um because you know we we can't just be supporting small farmers and buying local um because again that's just going to leave out food workers and, and their ability to actually win dignified workplaces. Um, so just quickly, I wanted to share um, over the last couple of weeks, Food Chain Workers Alliance has held multiple calls with our member organizations all across the country to figure out what demands we should be putting forth. Um, you know, food workers who serve, deliver, distribute, process and harvest our food are doing critical work in this moment of crisis and every day. Food workers are still on the job throughout the food chain and every aspect of the food supply chain are essential services for the public and recognized as such in many government orders. This is highlighting what food workers have been saying for years, our work makes it possible for the world to eat. Yet food workers on the front lines are facing such dangerous working conditions. Shout out to the Whole Foods and Amazon workers who are right now engaged in a um, sick out and strike. Um, that takes tremendous bravery and courage to do so. And, you know, however you can recognize that strike by not ordering online to Amazon or going to Whole Foods in this moment is so critical to show solidarity with those workers. Um, so, you know, folks are facing loss of wages and lack of access to healthcare while many corporations are profiting off this crisis. Urgent action is needed by all levels of government to protect food workers and not just big business now and in the long term. Um, and again, we can put this, I've just summarized very quickly what some of the demands are, but we can share with you all the um, very specific policy provisions that we're looking for. But generally, um, health and safety of workers must be a priority, um, fair working conditions. And this means that there needs to be access to free testing, healthcare coverage, and paid sick days regardless of someone's immigration status and size of workplace. You know, we're seeing in many other countries that in, for example, in the UK, um, people are given home tests so that they can do at their own home before knowing whether they can go into a workplace. We know that right now um, people are carrying um, COVID for multiple days without showing any symptoms. And if we're going to actually protect each other, there needs to be access to free testing everywhere. Um, we need to support workers faring, facing job loss and wage loss. Um, for million, millions of workers, you know, who are living paycheck to paycheck, um, this is presenting an immediate and long-term crisis, and especially around restaurant workers, and I'm sure um, we'll hear more about that later and then again just to reiterate you know immigration and undocumented workers first and foremost all of them must be benefiting from the same things that everyone else is regardless of status and so we're calling for an immediate moratorium on all immigration enforcement um an immediate release of all immigrant immigrants that are detained and a removal of restrictions on work permits for guest workers and migrant workers who've been laid off or terminated um so that mostly um, 
completes my presentation there. It's kind of all over the place, but um, in any event, uh, Thank you so much for, for joining me um, in, in allowing me to share with you all today. And um, I just feel incredibly inspired by um, the work that food system workers are doing with or without unions across our country right now. Um, and you know, if you can set up any sort of car parades going to farms or um, supermarkets and just shouting out the courage that, that those workers are having right now, um, I think whatever you can do to show them your support is just incredibly important right now. Yeah, Rose, thank you so much. This was uh, a, a really, really good presentation. And just to reiterate a couple of things. One, we will be sharing uh, some resources and some actions that you can do uh, after the presentations. Uh, and also we're gonna have Q&A. So we'll be able to, we'll open it up so that folks can ask questions uh, of Rose, of Antonio, of Teofilo after the, after the presentations. Um, up next, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Antonio Tovar um, from the Farm Worker Association of Florida, um, who will be talking to us about um, uh, farm workers in general, but I think also a little bit about the history of our farm system and how we went from um, African slavery to the current context of um, mostly immigrant workers, uh, mostly from Latin America, although obviously there's exceptions to that. So with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Antonio. You're on mute. Um, I'm, I'm on mute. <laughs> and, uh, so, Antonio, uh, you want me to share your slides? I you want to do it yourself. Uh, Sure, sure. If you want to share them, I can I can share it. Share okay, them too. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm going to thank uh, Rose because she actually covered a lot of of uh, of what we have been doing for the last 37 years. Uh, driver license, uh, doing uh, interviews with workers, and knowing how bad the conditions are. But I want to talk about the context and why we are where we are, because this is not this is not happening in the vacuum. Uh, someone, you know, there have been so many webinars that I can really point out uh, the person that uh, say we are living a indiv individualistic system that create social uh, catastrophe. So uh, that promotion in the, that individual is what keep us up, keep us apart and create this system of inequality. So, but where it comes from, so basically is, is, is this, this different process of production. Uh, I think that from, and it's not to also uh, make the indigenous uh, communities here um, romanticized because they also were empires, you know, the Aztec empires, the, 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 the Incan empires, they were cruel. They were not a very nice people, but basically uh, the, the, the European system of agriculture was based on animal, uh, animal uh, protein more than vegetable protein. So that would be one of the, of the main difference. Uh, that will require a more land uh, usage than the, um, the indigenous uh, production. Uh, that's the land expansion and the labor expansion because you need a lot of labor to do this, this, this production. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about imperialist in consolidation, global war and industrial agriculture and where we are now. Um, I have to say that the Farm Worker Association of Florida is also part of La Via Campesina. So we, are, we see this issue as a global issue. Uh, because yes, what is happening in America, we can see the relationship, relationship with what is happening beyond the United States. Uh, what is happening in the Farm Bill is something that is going to have repercussions beyond the, the, the United States. So one of the practices, and it's not just in, in the Americas, also the African uh, communities have many of these practices of regeneration, regeneration of land, of soils, of sustainability. Uh, on the contrary, the European system was based ma mainly in extraction. There was 
obviously they have a more reduced uh, 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 ability to land. They have also a more uh, difficult in terms of weather conditions to production. So the main purpose or uh, let's say the intention of the European agriculture was more extraction. And we can see it by the kind of products that they were, uh, they were producing. They were commodities more than food. Cotton, tobacco, sugar cane. Uh, it is a real a, a direct correlation in terms of the usage of labor, uh, in uh, forced uh, labor, and also production. Uh, we saw it not just in the United States, but also in the, in the Caribbean uh, and in Brazil, which, which was the, the main uh, User or user of slavery, and also the ones that ended slavery at the end. That's also why in Brazil the inequalities are so so uh, so um, big, uh, bigger than in the United States. Now, sharecropping and indenture is uh, the process that the United States has been using as a system also to produce uh, the land, the, the cheap labor. And there's a very good uh, book in terms of how the United States and England uh, developed this free labor or this system of free labor. I, I can give you the bibliography a little bit later, but uh, something that is important in terms of the systematic problem is that all these were uh, backed up by laws. So, Everything that is being uh, done in the United States, the displacement of indigenous people, the importation of slavery, the sharecropping, all have a legal um, background or a legal framework in which these systems operate. And that's why I make this a bigger problem. It's exactly what is happening right now with the law that is trying to provide for, for the communities or for the people. Uh, but it's also why most of the money is going to corporations. They are not going for the people. Uh, it is also why agriculture is still uh, problematic and, and not just, not just a fun work, but also uh, people in the restaurants and people that clean houses because it's exactly the same framework. All this framework comes from slavery. So the, the other part in indenture, and this is a picture of uh, the Bracero program, the second Bracero program, it's also the process of transformation in agriculture. So the, war, this, the first world war and the second world war actually give a lot of tools for agriculture to change the system and become an industrialized uh, agricultural system because a lot of the uh, weapons that were developed during, during this time are the same, uh, the same weapons that they use for pesticide use, usage. DDT was invented for uh, killing mosquitoes in the Pacific because the Pacific mosquito was killing more soldiers than the Japanese in, in, in the Second World War and also uh, mechanization. So when you have a, a large producer of mechanization and also a lot of people that is not able to work the land, you, develop, you use these tools to produce more and also use uh, indentor uh, labor that is the, 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 the Bracero program and now the H2A program, which I'm going to talk a little bit later. But all this, what is called is agricultural exceptionalism. And all these different laws are laws that do not apply to farm workers, neither to uh, domestic workers. And at, at to some extent, to people that is working on the restaurants and they are working in the kitchens because there is less possibility to unionize, there is less regulation on the age of the workers, there is uh, no sick time, there is not overtime in farm work, there's a lot of conditions that do not apply for these workers because they were excluded, excluded from all these acts. Now, for example, we are an association because we are unable to unionize. Uh, there's just few states uh, that where farm workers were able to unionize, like California, and that's why I put uh, uh, this, this um, well-known figures in California that they were able to, 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 uh, to have 
uh, unions. And also to remind that Dolores Huerta was before Cesar Chavez who, who started this, this movement and Larry Itlioch, uh, the Filipino that was also key in this process. Now, obviously this is uh, like the minimum uh, ask that we have in terms of changing federal law uh, for, for farm workers, but uh, like Rose, we also have some specific on terms of, of the regulations that we would like to change in Florida, like the driver license. Uh, last year, we, we passed a law called SB 168. We are suing the governor because this is a preventing law on sanctuary cities. Uh, many law, many uh, states, uh, especially in the South, they have a lot of tools to, uh, to disenfranchise workers. Uh, the sanctuary cities, for instance, there's not a single uh, sanctuary city in Florida, not a county, but still we have a crown of the 45 that say that we need to prevent a uh, sanctuary city and try to, to take all the undocumented out of the state when actually it's the workers that sustain two of the main industries in, in Florida, which is a service industry, you know, the many parks and also agriculture. What it happens is actually that trigger the police to, to do more uh, agreements with ICE. Before this law, Florida have four uh, counties that have uh, agreements with ICE. And after this law passed, right now we have 37 counties that have agreements with ICE. At the federal level, uh, there is a legislation that passed in Congress and is now in the Senate, but it's, it's, it's not a very good law because it has a lot of problems uh, how it was uh, moved forward. There is sections in there that will make many of our members unqualified for this, for this, uh, for this law. This law basically is a negotiation to expand the H-2A workers or to make it year-round uh, workers. The H-2A workers is the workers that come with a visa of permit to work in, in the United States. And these workers are basically displacing many of the workers uh, that, has, they, that have been here for a longer period of time. Now, there is uh, also a, a, a path to, to regularization of the workers that are in here but many of the clause that were there, they are going to make a lot of these workers difficult, especially in Florida. Because when you have in Florida, uh, 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 when you don't have Florida access to driver licenses, then the worker or many of the workers are going to be stopped repeatedly, and then they will have a record and they will not qualify for this specific piece of legislation. The other problematic part is the E-Verify. E-Verify, you probably are, are more aware of that regulation. And basically, in, in, in many of the workers are going to be unable to regularize their status and the time frame that they are doing for, for that. So they will need very deep changes uh, on that regulation for us to, to support it. And finally, many of what Rose was saying that uh, this new support that are being created is leaving a lot of workers without the possibility of, uh, of receiving some benefits when they are paying taxes, they are uh, essential, they're still working. Something that is happening in, in, in farm work is that many of the H2A workers, and I put the graph in there, Florida is the yellow, uh, that is the highest right now. North Carolina is in decline because most of the workers were in tobacco and now it's not a very, um, it's, 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 uh, it's in decline consumption of tobacco. But many of the H2 workers in Florida are in, in food crops. So they are working insane number of hours while workers that are on documents, they are on ornamental uh, production, flowers, ferns, plans for decoration, so they are losing their jobs. But they can, they can move to, to food production because these companies have H2A 
and they have E-Verify. So they are unable to work with them. Uh, even when many of the goers are, are not getting no. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to do a time check that you have okay. about one minute left. Perfect, because this is my last slide. Great. <laughs> so what I, what I was, I was uh, just uh, concluding is that uh, local farm workers are unable to join there. Uh, citrus workers, 90% are H2A workers, tobacco workers, 80% are H2A workers, uh, vegetables, at least 50% are H2 workers. So many of these farm workers are unable to go to work. And I basically finished there. You see? Ah. Perfect timing. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank you, Antonio. Let me finish. Um, stop sharing. Excellent. Uh, and so to wrap up the the trio, the trio um, of wonder today, we have Teofilo Reyes from the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United. Um, and I think Teo is going to talk overall about how COVID has impacted the restaurant industry, but I think broader than that is also um, looking to um, talk to us about the restaurant industry and, and restaurant workers overall. Um, so I'll just hand it over to you, Theo. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks so much. It's such a, a pleasure to be with all of you uh, here. Um, yeah, I've been telling everyone on, on, on our team just how, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to, it, it, even though like the situation is unbearable, uh, what's happening around the country, you know, how we as organizers, how lucky we are to be able to work from home um, and to be able to, uh, you know, provide uh, for the needs of our of our members and, and actually do uh, something very meaningful and important. Um, and so I just want to remind everybody on here that, you know, the work that you're doing is really, really important and uh, I want to thank you for it. Um, we are, um, you know, in the middle of a crisis the likes that we've, um, never experienced the country in t as a whole, of course, but also um, uh, restaurant workers in particular, 46 states um, have closed all their dining rooms. Um, and that was as of uh, last week. So it's possible that by now it's all 50 states. Uh, and the uh, restaurants are working on, um, you know, they're doing delivery and takeout uh, where they are still open on skeleton staffs, which means that you know, just this huge uh, number of, of workers have, have lost their, um, their livelihood. Uh, as with uh, most of the workers in the food sector, they're living uh, paycheck to paycheck uh, and just in um, just tremendous uh, desperation because, you know, we don't have a social safety net in this country to speak of. Uh, what does exist largely excludes uh, many of uh, the workers in the system, you know, unemployment insurance benefits, uh, there are minimum, uh, you have to have earned, uh, you know, uh, certain amounts of income to qualify both over the last couple of paychecks and over quarter. And so there are a lot of workers who find that they are not qualifying for unemployment um, and just are, are simply don't know what to do. And they're in a situation where they can't go out and find work, right? They're being told to socially isolate, stay away. Uh, so our staff is, they're, they've become counselors, um, in effect, uh, you know, we're organizing, uh, but we're also, you know, counseling people and trying to assist them through all these, uh, you know, they've become counselors and therapists and social workers. And it's, uh, it's certainly taking a tremendous toll on, on all of us. Uh, but, um, you know, I think we're, we're really um, proud of what we're accomplishing. Uh, and I'm really happy to be able to share it with you. Uh, you know, nationwide, about uh, there's about 14 million um, restaurant workers uh, nationwide, or there were as of uh, you know as, as of a month ago. Uh, it's about 10 percent of the workforce, and a, a, as manufacturing has declined, um, you know, service work has increased, and uh, right now there are roughly, again, this is all pre the massive wave of unemployment that we've experienced, but there were roughly the same number of manufacturing and restaurant workers. And in most major, uh, if not all major metropolitan areas, the number of restaurant workers have actually surpassed the number of uh, manufacturing workers. 
and this is an overwhelmingly large, uh, overwhelmingly low wage workforce. And so our, our vision really for the industry uh, and for the, for the country and for the future is that we need to transform the food sector into the, into the backbone of the middle class. Uh, and that means raising wages for, for everybody. Right, we're we're definitely uh, involved in the in the fight for 15 to make sure that the entry level wage for anyone is is um, um, approaches something of a dignified wage, which would be 15 dollars, and then also making sure that all tipped workers get a full wage. As with the history of farm workers, there's a tremendous amount of exclusion that occurs with uh, with restaurant workers, uh, and going back to Going back to um, emancipation, which is when tipping as a system in this country really proliferated, uh, and you had uh, the service industry push to uh, be able to hire um, newly emancipated slaves and not have to pay them, newly freed human beings, um, and not have to pay them uh, uh, for their labor. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, we all know, I think everyone has heard the, the stories of the, you know, the Pullman porters, they were, they were, they were both, uh, restaurant servers and, um, you know, uh, room attendants, um, essentially, you know, lodging, hotel and lodging accommodations workers, uh, and they were required to live off of tips, uh, but the same applied to most of the service sector. And when the um, Fair Labor Standards Act was passed uh, in the 30s, uh, restaurant, along with farm workers, um, restaurant workers were also excluded as were gro uh, uh, grocery store workers, um, uh, gasoline attendants, gasoline station attendants, all these, all these uh, occupations that eventually became, uh, were dependent on tips at the time. And the way they handled it is they set up this mechanism where it, the, the minimum wage only applied to interstate commerce, not to intrastate commerce. And they, uh, they included all service uh, producing uh, businesses as intrastate commerce, meaning that they did not apply for the, apply for the uh, minimum wage, uh, and they actually weren't included until 1966 when um, the minimum wage, the subminimum wage, was set at 50 percent. So if you earn tips, you were entitled to at least half of the minimum wage. Uh, and in 1991, the minimum wage grew to 4.25. Uh, the subminimum wage grew to two dollars and thirteen cents, and then. Um, in 1996, negotiations to raise the minimum wage, uh, essentially the minimum wage increase passed on the, but they negotiated restaurant workers out of it so that they uh, froze the subminimum wage at 213. And so it's been there since 1991 at the, at the federal level. But we have been working around the country to uh, increase that wage and we've gotten it increased in, lot, in many states, uh, you know, places like Colorado and Arizona will have, have minimum wages that are uh, over eight dollars an hour. Same thing as subminimum wages. Excuse me. That are over eight dollars an hour, even as the minimum wage, uh, you know, approaches um, approaches fifteen. Uh, but we continue to make progress. Uh, it's been our history that we've uh, we've seen um, restaurant workers excluded from paid sick day bills. But as 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 a result of an amount, an enormous amount of organizing, we've managed to get paid uh, to get restaurant workers included in every paid sick leave bill that's been that has, that had that had passed uh, over the past five years uh, until the last uh, week, basically. Um, and what we saw last week is that the first of the major relief bills passed and in, in provided emergency uh, paid sick leave, emergency family leave to many workers, uh, but it excluded all employers uh, with more than 500 employees. So all corporate, large corporations were completely excluded from some of these basic uh, protections. Um, so all low wage service wor workers who work for a large corporation have been excluded from these basic protections. Um, this was reiterated again with the CARES Act that just passed um, and it, uh, there, are, there are benefits in there also, not just the, the paid sick leave and the family leave that exclude large corporations. Um, there's also the ability to, um, for the smaller businesses, um, they're able to access funds contingent on them rehiring their, their workers. These, um, these same strings, uh, these same um, uh, requirements don't apply to large corporations. So uh, we're back in the position of having to fight for a, you know, paid sick leave uh, as a basic right for, uh, for workers who've been excluded. Um, and then that's 
that's sort of uh, where we see our value added at, at this moment. Uh, we've been involved in supporting all the legislation that is passing, of course, um, but we are engaged in a, in a massive campaign to organize uh, workers at, at, uh, at large corporate chains. Um, we've, we were able to, um, pretty early in, the, in this, uh, several weeks ago, we were able to get Darden to offer paid sick leave uh, voluntarily to, its, um, to all of their workers uh, around the country. Uh, and, we, and they're now offering emergency uh, uh, financial assistance to many of their uh, workers. It's not perfect, it's, it's, it doesn't cover everybody, but it, but it covers everyone who has seniority at, at, at the least. So at least people, workers who've been, uh, you know, who've worked at, um, at uh, Darden for over a year, at least uh, are entitled to these benefits. Um, uh, our major right now target is Applebee's, uh, and we've been getting, um, petitions. Um, we've set up a site called uh, applebeesisrotten.com and we've gotten over 250,000 uh, workers and allies to send emails directly to Applebee's uh, corporate headquarters demanding that they take care of their workers. Uh, and we've also set up through um, coworker.org, we've set up uh, multiple uh, petitions both to, um, to Applebee's, to Denny's, to uh, Chili's, uh, and to Caribou, and we've gotten over 12,000 workers who have um, signed up to those petitions and, and have been uh, become engaged with us. We had this, uh, we had these grandiose plans um, several months ago that we were going to build our online infrastructure and organize um, 140,000 workers to be uh, dues-paying members. Uh, we. We're still working on that, but part of that involved, included also organizing 14,000 um, activists and uh, 1,400 leaders nationwide, and we've vast, vastly surpassed those uh, goals because of the current crisis. We have, uh, we're getting a 70% rate of um, a response rate on our, uh, on our action request to our members, and so we're trying to direct them, one, to to force Applebee's uh, to break this facade of, the, of these, uh, We'll break this line of these corporations that are uh, lobbying to be excluded from these positions, uh, provisions, and then working to make sure that all workers are included in those provisions. We've also set up a relief site. It's um, called rockunited.org backslash relief. It's our disaster relief fund. Uh, we, we had to shut it down. We had to pause. Actually, we had to pause it after we got about, um, after we got 9,099 um, applicants, we paused it because we're overwhelmed in, in dealing with that and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with everyone who's applied, uh, talking to them, providing them resources. Uh, we have a resource page on our website that uh, brings together resources from around the country uh, and from every state. And then we're providing financial relief uh, from 100 to $300 based on one, whether they're undocumented, whether they have a child or an elderly relative in the care and whether they have urgent and immediate needs such as um, you know, if they're facing an eviction. Uh, we need to raise um, about two and a half million dollars right now just to support the people who are in line in that, in that relief uh, fund. Uh, so we are, uh, you know, we're, we're seeking donations. We're getting a lot of donations from around the country, but we're seeking more. And ideally we'd like to reopen it because we have um, you know, thousands of workers who, have, who are in need, desperate need, and who keep asking for, um, for assistance. Again, when we, um, when we reach out to these individuals, we're organizing them, we're giving them a toolkit of things they can do, uh, organize their coworkers, uh, set up online petitions, organize uh, virtual tip jars for their regulars, uh, and also directing them to take action with us nationally and, and to take political action as well to demand um, accountability. Uh, some of the key demands that we're pushing for is um, is uh, one earned sick leave for emergency uh, urgent uh, earned sick leave for everybody. Um, we're demanding uh, immediate uh, cash assistance to everyone, including undocumented workers who have been excluded from most uh, almost all the provisions, other than the uh, increased SNAP benefits. Um, we're calling for OSHA standards to include uh, frontline service workers with uh, personal protective equipment. Um, so those are some of the main things we're working on and we're looking to uh, keep on mobilizing and growing after this. We, um, I sort of am going backwards. We have, you know, we've set up, we have 10 offices around the country and all those offices are um, working 
uh, hard to process uh, applicants, to organize people, to engage in fights. We've been supporting the campaigns to stop uh, stop uh, uh, evictions that have, and we've won those rights in Oakland and in um, Los Angeles, and are working to uh, support that nationally. Um, so that's uh, you know that's a big picture what we're doing, but this really is in our DNA. We were founded after September 11th by the um, um, uh, by the restaurant workers who survived um, the uh, the attack on 9/11. Um, you know we were, we set up this relief fund which supported both the surviving restaurant workers, the ones that were lucky enough not to be on uh, 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 on shift that day as well as the families of, of the victims. Uh, and so we're you know, essentially going, going back to our roots uh, and trying to provide basic support to workers as we organize them to improve conditions um, around across the food system. So thank you. Thank you, Theo. Uh, and thank you, Rose. And thank you, Antonio. Um, at this point, we wanna take a, a few minutes, 15 minutes for Q&A. So I know there's a ton of questions already flowing on the chat. Um, some of those questions can be uh, asked to the presenters directly, um, or if you have other questions that you haven't typed into the, um, into the uh, chat box, feel free to ask them at this point. Um, I think you can unmute yourself and uh, and speak. One thing that I know um, everyone is asking themselves right now is, uh, so, so Theo, you mentioned the relief fund. Um, is there something similar for farm workers or for other workers in other sectors of the, of the food system? Yes, yes, they are. Um, and you know, I think that uh, Theo mentioned something that, that unfortunately happened also in sectors where there is a lot of uh, uncertainty, like uh, in Florida, we have hurricanes like every other year. So now this is different because obviously uh, it's going to be a long term um, problem. Uh, but yeah, there, there, there is some, 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 there's not going to be enough money. That's, that's for sure. Especially because Congress is giving the money to corporations and not to the people. Um, but also locally, like there's many workers, like restaurant workers and other server, service workers, and even in agriculture, like how, how much time is going to happen before many of these places will open? Um, there is many nurseries that they, are, they won't be able to tra transition from these pretty plants to produce food, which is what we have been, we, sh we always have said we should be doing. Uh, but there they are, there are uh, some, some uh, ways and some people, like some organizations already have experience doing the transfer of, of some support for, for workers. Rent right now, at least in the agricultural community in Florida, they are more concerned about rent, uh, childcare, uh, and, and, and utilities, because they know they can farm in their backyard. They, they, they actually, we also have uh, some gardens that they are producing some food, but the rent, they are not going to be covered by this, by this law. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just mention, we do have a fund specific for the worker center here in Massachusetts. That's a, um, for undocumented workers who can't access unemployment. I just put it in the, um, the chain in the, uh, group chat there, but I just also encourage folks, you know, to check out groups in your own areas, um, to support undocumented workers there. I know many, um, organizations are creating those types of funds in, in your specific areas. And um, a volunteer out here has created a pledge for folks who are gonna be getting the COVID-19 checks, you know, the $1,200 that if folks are continuing to make an income 
and that's just going to be extra money um, to make a pledge that they'll give the, that money to undocumented workers. So for those of you out there that might have some flexibility in terms of pledging some of that money or all of that money to undocumented workers in your community, I would encourage you to do so. I know myself, um, you know, my plan is to give a, a large chunk of my my check to to the undocumented workers in my community who won't be getting any sort of you know quote unquote bailout right now. And, and like Rose said, there's a lot of folks have set that up in their local communities. Um, so you can probably find ones in your own local community as well. So you can get money directly to folks um, in your region as a way of getting folks direct money. And I think I also just want to reiterate as we're thinking about donating what all these speakers have shared is the importance of their own work, right? In terms of being the ones who have been organizing workers for a long time and building power so that we actually can hold corporations accountable like, like the Dardens and others. Um, and the importance right now in investing in that organizing so that we can really continue to move together um, and not just, not just doing charity uh, donations, but also solidarity organizing. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> so I, I have just been told that we have about five to seven minutes left for Q&A. So does anyone else have questions? So I see on the chat box here a couple of questions. Um, one is, how can we help farm workers facing environmental challenges? And another question is, is there a list of corporate targets and asks that can be compiled and shared. So, so right now the EPA suspended all what is uh, environmental uh, inspections. So I think that, that I, and probably there is uh, something circulating. I know that there's uh, in terms of uh, enforcing environmental law, like uh, farm workers are exposed to pesticides uh, in addition to COVID-19, and they don't have protections. I have one uh, worker that told me that uh, they receive one pair of gloves a month for their work. So. Great. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Ideas? I want to chime in. This is Bob. Thank you, everyone um, who's been present here. Um, I'm just coming to this space of um, our project, and I guess I'm just reflecting in the different ways in which um, you know inequities are showing up and strengthening in this time, and reflecting on how that shows up in the funding landscape. Um, seeing, you know, just like different emergency or relief funds that are emerging and <clears throat> just witnessing the pattern of like, like who are the orgs that are able to um, create those funds versus more like just kind of grassroots mutual aid, independent, you know, on a local neighbor. to create funds. Your internet is going in and out, Paola. Maybe if you're able to type into the chat or turn the video off, maybe. Still can't hear you if you're talking. I think we, <laughs> I think we lost her. Um, if she comes back, we'll plug her back in. Um, Hello. Any other last minute um, questions or ideas or anything you want to share? We are almost out of time for Q&A, but we still want to continue this discussion, obviously, and there's so much more um, to be shared and uh, to be continued. Um, one thing that I wanted to make sure that we did here is that we talked about some of the campaigns and actions uh, that some of our members are 
uh, are leading. I know that's been a theme in the chat box. A lot of people asking questions about uh, corporate targets and about what kind of campaigns and how to get involved and how to help. And so we wanted to lift up three, but we want to also uh, make sure that uh, you all know that we will be sharing um, a longer list with everyone. Um, the first thing is uh, Food Chain Workers Alliance uh, put together this amazing uh, resource that's called the five things you can do for food workers today. Uh, it is in the context and with the frame of COVID-19. Um, so highly recommend that you look at that. Uh, Suzanne shared the link, but it's also uh, going to be shared in the, uh, it's being shared right now in the chat box. And also it's gonna be shared um, with the notes when we send the notes for this uh, webinar. Um, the, second, um, the second thing is uh, Brand Workers has a campaign that's ongoing um, on Amy's Bread. Uh, both uh, Amy's Bread and um, a couple of other companies in, in New York City have been using ICE as an excuse or immigration, I guess, immigration status as an excuse for getting rid of folks who are either organizing or who are participating and and just um, asserting their rights. Uh, and so there's a campaign really to um, hold them accountable. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're we asking folks to, to do today. Um, and then the last one is um, obviously there's a, a whole lot of activity in Washington DC right now around um, these bailouts. Um, and we know that uh, you know, the first packet has a whole lot of very generous um, handouts to corporations and crumbs for workers and for organizations that are supporting workers. Uh, so we want to make sure that the following packet packages that Congress passes are not um, as uh, one-sided as the first one. Um, so we want to ask for your support and, and make sure that we're working alongside with all of our allies, our members, like Food Chain Workers Alliance and the three organizations that you heard today and others to ensure that we're actually doing everything that we can to uh, amplify workers' voices in this food workers in particular. Um, and the last thing that I want to mention uh, is that, you know, this COVID-19 has really upended the food system, as all of you know, right? And that, and the economic system that, that actually underpins that. Um, but in order for us to move forward, um, towards a comprehensive vision of what we want the world to look like after this crisis is over, um, we need to have a clear vision of what that world uh, should look like, right? Um, because right now, I think uh, we all know that the, the, uh, the likelihood is that um, these large corporations who have access to Congress and to other folks in power are going to insert their priorities and that we're going to end up uh, after this crisis in a very similar world that we were before the crisis. Um, but we don't necessarily have to end up there, right? We, I think this is giving us a sense, and I think this is part of what uh, Paola was saying before she got cut off, right, is that um, through mutual aid and through supporting ourselves, supporting each other, we are getting a glimpse at what we could do together instead of alone. Um, ironically, that we're all separated and, and isolated uh, during the time where we're actually expressing the most solidarity, but we need everyone to have a voice in that. So we're asking people to help shape what that vision looks like. And um, we will be, uh, if you have thoughts about it right now, I'm, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, if not, I really want to continue this conversation uh, with you either at an individual level or maybe even set up a follow-up uh, group conversation with all of the folks who might be interested in having that conversation. So 
with that, just a quick um, pause, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Marla. Thanks, Jose. And yeah, I see there's a lot of, in, oh, there's a bit of interest here in terms of, yeah, staying connected around cross-organizational efforts. Um, and there was also a question about um, future webinars uh, along, along these series. And so that is perfect segue <laughs> to Zenith, who's going to share with us a little bit more on some next steps regarding um, these webinar series. Thank you for all those questions and reflections and uh, links to actions and to Jose for moderating us and walking us through how we can support each other in this moment. Um, so we know that to really act in solidarity, we need to understand each other's issues. And that's the purpose of these webinars. Uh, so we um, really want you to invite, really want to invite you to join us for the next one, which will be on opportunity for all producers. We know that regional farmers are ready to feed their communities in this moment, but many of them lack the infrastructure and are locked out of institutions and market, markets for them to be able to do so. Uh, so in our next webinar, we'll be hearing from organizers and farmers who are working to change that. We're hoping to release that in June. Uh, so we hope you'll join us. And until then, you can access the Dignity for Workers resources um, here using this link. And let's see, maybe we can also put it in the chat box. We'll do that, Zina. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to pass it back to Marlon. Great. Thank you, Zina. And I just dropped the link in now. I believe that's the correct one. Um, Go ahead, Navina. Yeah, just to, just to remind folks that part of that toolkit, so, so this, this work, as folks have already shared, is ongoing work, right? Um, all those organizations that you mentioned and the people or that you've heard from, people that are on this webinar have been working on this for a really long time. Um, again, COVID is illuminating what's happening in the food system, but it's, it's ongoing work. And um, Zeynep has spent the last couple of months putting together a little, a little video explainer that shares with people what's happening in our food system. So you all that just spent an hour and a half on this webinar, we're so glad to have had you with us here. And you can share this three minute video with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and things like that so they can get the, the comprehensive, you know, quick rundown of what's happening with food workers and farm workers right now. There's also a short explainer. There's an interview, as mentioned, with um, Gabriel, who's working with brand workers and organizing uh, for Amy's bread to change their practices. Um, and we'll send out a bunch more resources too, but just a reminder to please share all this out with um, your friends and family so that everybody knows and everybody can be lifting up these issues for folks who are largely in, invisible to policymakers right now. Great. Back to Thank, you, you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, we are wrapping up here um so as we do that i just want to send a big thank you to all our members and guest speakers that joined today to share more about the work that they're doing and um, we all know and understand how important it is um, and we want to also thank our members that helped us craft this toolkit around this particular plank and um really just talking about the importance of workers all along the food chain. Uh, so thank you to all our members that helped us put together and to all of you for joining us today. Um, you know, it's often forgotten or put to the side group of folks that we're talking about um, and that we've learned about today. Um, so we appreciate everyone joining in and um, just to recap a few ways to get involved. We put in the chat box links to Amy's Bread Action, um, to uh, the list of um, the list of uh, actions you can take by uh, Food Chain Workers Alliance, and um, our our web page, which has some some of the asks that we asked for in the past in the stimulus that was recently passed, and that'll help inform um, the stimulus. 
um, conversations that move forward. So we really ask you to help amplify that. Um, so make sure to visit our website to keep up to date on what we're doing um, to support food and farm workers during this time and beyond. And um, yeah, thank you, Jose, Navina, Zineb, Kristen, uh, for all your great work on this as well. Thank you, and thank you, Marla, for great facilitation. Yeah, thank you all. Bye, everybody. Bye. Everybody. Bye.